Coming up today on Gardening by the Yard, an update on mosquito control. After that, I'll show off some really cool conifers and other evergreens I recently acquired. And last but hardly least, a man and his cyclamens. All that and more is in store, so stay tuned. It seems the first time I did a segment on mosquito control, hardly anyone in this country had ever even heard the words West Nile virus. Now you'd be hard pressed to find anyone unfamiliar with the disease or the culprit responsible for its spread. So today I'm going to review some basic age old strategies for controlling mosquitoes and present several new approaches as well. And of course the first and best line of defense is to protect yourself by covering exposed skin while working in the yard. That means wearing long pants and a long sleeve shirt as well as shoes and socks, even gloves and a hat. Various sprays applied to clothing offer additional protection. By far and away, the most popular mosquito sprays contain a chemical called diethyltualamide, better known as DEET, in varying concentrations. And while the scientific jury is still out on its safety, DEET doesn't appear to be all that harmful in lower concentrations, especially when applied to the clothing rather than directly to the skin. To protect the skin, there are a number of alternative sprays and lotions, most of which contain some sort of citrus oil. My favorite of the lot are these handy wipes, which you simply rub on exposed skin. And believe it or not, you can now buy clothing, shirts in particular, the fabric of which has been impregnated with a chemical mosquito repellent. And the repellent remains effective even after several washings. Or you can skip chemicals altogether and simply cover yourself, at least from head to waist, with a bug baffler shirt like this. The super fine mesh keeps mosquitoes out as well as flies. It's considerably more comfortable in hot weather than a long sleeve shirt, and it allows you plenty of freedom of movement, whether working in the yard or simply recreating. So do I pass my screen test? As important as protection is, prevention is arguably more so. After all, if you take steps to control mosquitoes and prevent them from taking over your property in the first place, you'll minimize the need for protection. And that first step toward prevention is the elimination of their breeding sites, which means getting rid of standing water anywhere and everywhere. And some of the most common mosquito breeding sites include clogged gutters, drain outlets from air conditioners, dripping faucets, old tires, children's wading pools, over-irrigated and poorly drained lawns, saucers under potted plants, tree stumps and tree holes, watering cans and buckets, and wheelbarrows. And that's the short list. If you were to walk around your property, especially after a rain, I'm sure you'd find plenty of other places where water collects. Now, naturally, there are some places where you want water to remain, such as a bird bath or maybe a pond. And in situations like that, all you really need is a donut. A BT donut, that is. This particular form of the bacteria BT, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, is still the most effective way to control mosquitoes in standing water, and it isn't toxic to birds or fish. This granular form of BT is also available, which you just sprinkle into the water. And a new version of the same thing is now available in these convenient disposable pouches, which last for 30 days and treat up to 300 gallons of water. Citronella continues to offer excellent protection against mosquitoes, whether in the form of candles or torches filled with oil. It works best in smaller areas, which makes it perfect for use on the patio while dining or entertaining. And by the way, here's a little trick I learned quite by accident several years ago. If you'll place an unlit citronella candle or a container filled with citronella oil in an area where bugs and spiders are a real problem, such as your garden shed, in no time at all, guess what? No more bugs and spiders. And don't forget how effective a fan on the porch or patio can be. You see, mosquitoes, as well as flies, can't stand windy conditions. Well, there you have a recap of some of the more traditional mosquito control methods. Now I want to show you several new approaches for keeping mosquitoes at bay. First up is this all-natural granular product that you simply sprinkle on the lawn. And it deters not only mosquitoes, but gnats as well. And one application lasts for weeks, regardless of rainfall. The active ingredients in this stuff are various oils derived from things like lemongrass, mint, and garlic, all of which slowly decompose and break down into beneficial soil conditioners. One five-pound container will treat and provide protection for up to 4,000 square feet of lawn. 
And as a sort of bonus, well, this stuff leaves your lawn smelling like your favorite Vietnamese or Thai restaurant. Yummy! And speaking of natural oils, this cute little portable fan-powered repeller uses one of the most effective oils around. It's made from a particular geranium. All you do is add a cartridge containing the oil, and you get up to 30 days of protection from all species of bloodsuckers, as well as flies, gnats, even moths. This gizmo protects an area up to roughly 300 square feet, which makes it ideal for setting on a dining table outdoors or maybe on a picnic blanket. It comes with two cartridges, and refills are also available. Here's a trap you might want to add to your arsenal of mosquito control devices. It uses a powerful pheromone to attract female mosquitoes, which, by the way, are the only ones that actually attack humans. Go away, mosquitoes, go away. To activate the trap, you simply add rainwater or pond water, a lure, and an activator. You place the trap in an area where mosquitoes are a problem, and you wind up with six weeks of control in an area up to a quarter acre. And last but hardly least, there's this contraption, which looks for all the world like those bug zappers you used to see and hear all over suburbia. And it does indeed plug in and hang just like those zappers of yesteryear, but it's relatively quiet. The only noise you hear is that of a small fan inside the housing. And it's made specifically for mosquitoes, which it lures and traps rather than zaps. It actually contains two lures, one in the form of ultraviolet light that mimics human body heat, and the other in the form of a photocatalyst that reacts to form titanium dioxide, a compound similar to carbon dioxide, which is what attracts mosquitoes to humans more than anything else. There are also some very impressive and rather expensive mosquito control devices out there, nearly all of which burn propane to produce the carbon dioxide. And if you've got several hundred dollars to spend, by all means, get one. However, these less expensive approaches work well, and you don't have to deal with refilling all those empty propane tanks, which is a chore I truly abhor. I mean, I really can't stand doing that. It just drives me crazy every time I have to empty a tank. And besides, for reasons I can't fully explain, mosquitoes rarely bother me. I certainly exhale plenty of carbon dioxide, more than most folks, in fact. And at one point, I used to think it was because I ate so much garlic. But now I'm convinced it's because I'm in the television business, a business for which you need really thick skin. So I'm going to plant it directly in the garden in a spot where it gets full sun. Woo, that bee almost got me. Up until about midday, followed by afternoon shade. Meet 12 Tough Realtors. By now, I'm guessing it's hardly a secret that I'm crazy about conifers. I started planting them when I moved into this place five years ago, largely because at the time it was 100% deciduous. And now, well now I've got over 50 really cool conifers. And today, I'm going to add a bunch more. But before I show you my new babies up close, I thought I'd introduce you to some conifers I planted last fall. Here, for example, is a golden deodar cedar, also known as Cedrus deodara aria. Though not a true weeper, this beauty will nevertheless develop gracefully arching branches as it matures and ultimately should hit 25 feet or so. And here's a really cool weeping bald cypress. This thing will only get more striking over time. And yes, it's a conifer, although it isn't evergreen. This new weeping Norway spruce is looking great, and in time it'll spread to nearly 10 feet while remaining only 5 feet high. This is Picea abes pendula. And last but not least, I recently planted this Japanese pine, Pinus parviflora glauca. This guy will top out at 50 to 80 feet, but not in my lifetime. You see, it's such a slow grower that it's often used as a bonsai specimen. Okay, now it's time to show you the new stuff. And to kick things off, check out this yew. This is Taxus baccata stricta aria, and it's a narrow, upright grower that should grow to about eight feet. Wow, that was quite a mouthful. Now, just for fun, what do you say we break down the Latin? Taxus is the genera in which all yews reside. Baccata means having fruits with a pulpy, berry-like texture. Stricta means strict, upright, and aria means golden. Put them all together and you get Taxus baccata stricta aurea, or a yew with pulpy, berry-like fruits that grows upright and is gold in color. See, Latin really does come in handy now and then. And speaking of things Roman, here's a plant I can't seem to find a home for. It's a Cupressus arizonica, better known as an Arizona cypress. 
I'm struggling with my indecision because although this plant is hardy in my area and enjoys hot weather, it doesn't hold up all that well in high humidity, which is plentiful around here. On second thought, I think I'll hold off planting this one for now. This is Camiciparis obtusa split rock, a named variety of the famed Hinoki cypress. And as you can see, I've stuck it in a pot, at least for now, because even when full grown, it's a shorty, topping out at three, maybe four feet. Here's another dwarf form of the Hinoki, one called Rees Dwarf. And as you can see, it too has found a home in a container. This Hinoki, on the other hand, will grow to about eight feet tall. So I'm gonna plant it directly in the garden in a spot where it gets full sun. Woo, that bee almost got me up until about midday, followed by afternoon shade. So, can you tell I'm an oaky who really likes hinokis? This little cryptomeria called Elegans compacta is a real winner. Now this too can be a bit difficult to grow in a humid environment, but I've got it in this pot here, which means I can move it around all I want until I find a perfect spot for it. This is Picea sachensis papus, a young spruce I'd read about in a magazine and just had to have. Just look at its new growth. Gorgeous, huh? And finally, here's a curious plant, one that's not a conifer, but an evergreen that's native to Chile. This is Araucaria aracana, better known as the monkey puzzle tree. And in the wild, it can reach heights of 40 feet. Of course, it isn't anywhere near hardy here in my area, so I'll have to overwinter it indoors, assuming I can find the room. And just why is it called the monkey puzzle tree? Well, some say it's because only a monkey is capable of climbing it without being stabbed by its thorn-tipped leaves. As I acquire new plants, I'll make sure I show them to you. After all, having more plant options is a worthy goal for all gardeners, amateurs and professionals alike. Of course, in my case, I'm neither an amateur nor a professional. I'm, uh, well, I'm a fanatic. We like to educate people that if a flower is really over the hill, you twist, the stem a little bit, and then you pull it. Check out over 1,000 designs. A few good plants for the garden. Why not try cyclamen? The blooms are unique, the foliage festive, and the crowns compact. Plus, they're more widely available than ever before in nurseries and garden centers across the country. Longtime grower and cyclamen expert Hans Gerritsen wants to show us what's so great about this fine family of plants. You know, if cyclamen had a slogan, it might be something like, We've been waiting for you. Four up, one down. Four up, one down. That would be the sound of cyclamen in perfect pedal position. Just look at these hardy troops. Can't you just hear the cheers of revelry? Very compact cyclamen, a lot of small leaves, compact flower habit, thick stems, and then the perfect flower is close to something like this. We have four petals up and then one down. They may look delicate, but cool weather cyclamen are actually tough soldiers on the planting fields. They spend part of the year at ease in dormancy. Then when the conditions are right, stand at attention in full bloom. So if we go between, say, 50 and 65, the plant loves it. If you have night temperatures that drop almost till freezing, the cyclamen will still survive. And that's the beauty of it. Perennial cyclamen is very hardy, perfect for landscapes in the colder regions of the country. The leaves grow from the swollen root or tuber that sits just above the soil. The hardiest varieties are also smaller than the standard size flora cyclamen, but if you're looking for a happy medium, mid-size fits the bill. So for the home gardener, I'd recommend to plant a mid-size type of a smaller one right into the, the soil, whereas I would put a larger type maybe in a patio plant or deck out setting. Hey, if your smell-o-vision is working, you can sniff out another advantage of many mid-size cyclamen, fragrance. <laughs> and look at some of the other novelties breeders are devising for adventurous gardeners. Here we have a striata type, which almost looks like a parakeet type uh, tulip. Flames, fringed edges, ruffles. But the newest battle cry for cyclamen lovers? Eight up, two down. Well, you've seen the single flowering type, and now we're here looking at some double flowering type. The double flowering type is not really a product that you'd see every day. Now, most folks buy their cyclamen already in bloom largely because growing from seed is so time-consuming. 
But for the few, the proud, and the serene, the challenge is like a call to duty. Here's the key. Plant seeds in loose, well-drained soil. Hans uses just a dusting of vermiculite on top to cover and hold the seed in place. After the seed is planted and covered up, we'll water it in very well that it's moist. Then we'll put it in the germination chamber, which is a dark room, uh, which we maintain at roughly 58 to 60 degrees. After three weeks in a dark closet at home and five weeks in filtered light, the seedling will look like this. At 16 weeks, you can see the tuber and leaves forming nicely. Two weeks later, there are a few more leaves, but if you're willing to wait a full seven to nine months, the results are sensational. The drill to keep the cyclamen looking swell is much quicker. Well, we like to educate people that if a flower is really over the hill, you twist the stem a little bit and then you pull it. So the trick is really twist the stem and pulling it. That's how you clean a cyclamen. And then you have a gorgeous plant again. Three things will put a hurt on cyclamen, however. Overwatering, heat, and extreme light. If people get a product like this and they put it in the bright sunlight or under very dark conditions, it's not that good. There's a balance in the harmony with the plant likes. Perhaps the biggest complaint with cyclamen raised as houseplants is their seemingly untimely demise. Remember, these are cool weather plants. If they wind up in too warm a place, they may go into dormancy. Find the chilliest room in the house and you've found a happy home for your cyclamen. Then, water only as needed. Uh, rule of thumb is it's probably a watering issue. So if you go, we'll water it once a week, soak it heavily, then you're in good shape and then to kind of almost let it dry out. When the plants die back in the summer, you can stop watering altogether. Plants should be moved to a cool place, under a tree or onto a porch, while the flowers go on furlough. Most cyclamen are perennials because they develop a little tuber. So the tuber, if it's placed in the right location, they'll come back year after year. And that's how cyclamen can be all that they can be. Join the Army of Gardeners enlisting these proud soldiers in yards across America. Thanks, Hans, for that cyclamen sidebar. Hey, and get this, gang. To give you an idea of the longevity of this plant, the tubers can live to be upwards of 100 years old. No kidding. Unfortunately, however, I need to spend a bit more time with our latest arrival. That'd be Lucky. Lucky! Keeping wild animals out of the garden is tricky at best. In many parts of the country, deer are a huge problem, and elsewhere, people deal with everything from armadillos to zootermopsises. Oh, that's a type of termite. Hey, I couldn't think of anything else that started with a Z, okay? I mean, it's not like zebras are a problem in gardens. Not here, anyway. Domestic animals can be just as difficult to control, and they, too, can cause considerable damage. Unless, of course, they've been trained like Maggie here. You see, years ago, I taught her to stop whenever she encountered a mulched area. And since every square foot of my gardens has mulch, she's never been a problem. <laughs> That's right. Maggie's perfect, aren't you, dear? Mm. Unfortunately, however, I need to spend a bit more time with our latest arrival. That'd be Lucky. Lucky! And yet, strangely, although dogs can do considerable damage in the garden, I usually hear more complaints about cats. So I decided to look into various ways of keeping cats out of the garden. The first is this medieval-looking contraption that's basically a mat of spikes. Yikes! To use, you simply place the mat or mats on the ground in areas cats tend to frequent, and the spikes serve as an attention-getting deterrent to would-be garden invaders. Now, with all due respect to the folks who make these things, I'm not sure I want to protect my garden with spikes, largely because I'd probably be the first one to step on them. <laughs> and I wouldn't want my kids playing around them either. But I can see where they might come in handy, say, around a bird feeder or a bird bath or even a pond filled with fish. Or maybe around Lucky. <laughs> Repellents have been popular for years, especially granular products, which you routinely shake around plants or the perimeter of garden beds. Unfortunately, most such repellents on the market must be applied daily, which is a huge drag. And the active ingredient in them is toxic if absorbed through the skin. This little gizmo here uses the same active ingredient, 
but at least it houses the chemical inside this cute little mushroom or bell-shaped housing. To use, you simply fill the perforated post with the granules, screw on the lid, and place the whole thing in areas where cats, and dogs for that matter, tend to be a problem. According to the manufacturer, one of these things offers protection roughly 12 feet in every direction. What they don't tell you is how long the granules remain effective. So I guess you just replace it when it doesn't seem to be working all that well. So there you have a few tips for keeping cats out of your garden. Any one of which you might want to try if cats are a particular problem in your area. As for me, oh thanks, I've got all the help I need. <laughs> I've got dogs. Lucky!